Today's episode of The Casual Criminalist is brought to you by Athletic Greens. More on them in just a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, hello. I'm your host, Simon Wammers here. One of my writers, in this case, Arnaldo. Thank you, Arnaldo. Has written me a script. I've never read it before. We're going to read it together. It's called, it's what I call a cold read, which is also that thing people do with tarot cards. <laughs> Which is confusing, isn't it? Because this is facts and that is fiction. Oh, if you'd like more about that, check out my channel on YouTube, Decoding the Unknown. That'd be awesome. And also, while we get the plugs in at the beginning, have you left a review for this show yet? You should if you're listening as a podcast. I mean, you don't have to. It just makes me happy on the inside. And after the... uh, I just recorded an episode yesterday, two days in a row for Casual Criminals, for me, at least. And it was devastating. And I'm like... You know what makes me happy? Good reviews. It heals my insides, much like a therapist. Let's get into it. This is the tragic history of the murder of Francis Blandy, gentleman tragically murdered in the summer of the year of our Lord, 1751, by his own daughter, Mary Blandy, murderer, and by Captain William Crestone, a Scotsman and also a murderer. I get the feeling I already know what's going on. Uh, I mentioned I don't read these before. I get the feeling this is set in the past, and Arnaldo is giving me one of those crazy book titles from the past. Have you ever looked at, like, books from, like, the 1800s? Or, like, real back in the day? And it's always like, guys, you don't need to describe the entire book in the title. Just call it A Tragic History of Mary Blandy. Uh, sorry, Francis Blandy. The episode, the, the document's called Mary Blandy. Because I guess, uh... Arnaldo wanted to be brief in the, the title of the file. Um, I get the feeling we're going back in the day. I think this is an oldie worldy episode. Narrated by Signor Arnaldo Tian, Tia, Teodorani. Sorry, Arnaldo. I just realized I've never pronounced your surname before. <laughs> Arnaldo's Italian. Ah, parliamo italiano. For the delight and enjoyment of the most revered Simon Whistler, Esquire, and his most esteemable audience of patient listeners. Esquire means two different. In the UK, Esquire just means a gentleman, like a dude. Anyone can be like, yeah, Esquire. And I realized in America, that means you're a lawyer, right? That's weird. So, uh, yeah, people must think this a lot. No one, no one puts Esquire after the name. It's, it seems like a very pompous thing to do. It's the sort of thing you do sarcastically. Like, I always add, like, random titles and middle names and, like, I, I'm the first Simon Whistler. I'm not Simon Whistler the fourth, but sometimes if there's an option for it, I'll just say like, you know, when they're like, um, you know, when there's title, name, and then like post initial stuff, I'll just put random in there. I'll put like Simon Whistler the fourth. I, my, my middle name on my student ID was legend for four years just because no one ever checks this. Shit. Let's get into it. As you may have guessed from that period accurate title, today's story takes us to 18th century Britain. Nailed it. Although I said 1800s, didn't I? It's 18th century, which is the 1900s. My bad, but close enough. Our main character is Miss Mary Blandy, who in April of 1752 stood accused for the most appalling of crimes, the murder of her own kin. More precisely, she conspired with her diabolical paramour, Captain William Cranstown, to slowly poison her own father with arsenic. I don't know why I'm being so dramatic today. It does feel very dramatic, though, doesn't it? Her trial made quite the sensation in Georgian Britain, and it is still cited as a landmark case due to a very early use of forensic medicine by, uh, sorry, Forensic medicine, yes. Sorry, I was going to say some. I, I just assumed I read that wrong. But it is forensic medicine by the prosecution. I was going to say forensic science. And the verdict is still reviewed and discussed today, as Mary may not have been fully aware of her own actions. Are we exploring, is this a diminished responsibility? This is still a defense to murder, I believe. Uh, perhaps she had been tricked by her lover into dousing Mr. Blandy's food with what she believed to be a herbal remedy known as love powders. Oh, wait, no, she was just tricked. <laughs> Classic. No, 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 just put these love powders on his food. It'll be fine. It's good. It's, it's definitely not poison. You're not guilty of murder if you get tricked into murdering someone. I'm pretty sure that would be insane. It'd be like someone handing you like one of those knives, you know, where it slides into the sheath. And they're like, hey, look, 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 slides into the sheath. This is great. This is great. Look, I'm stabbing you. And then they hand it to you, but they sneakily switch it out. And they're like, yeah, go on, go on, stab me. jaw. And then they get, I don't know why they'd want it done on themselves, but you get my meaning. That person has been tricked into murder. They're not getting in any trouble, right? Because <laughs> that would be crazy. 
So, was Mary a conniving murderer or a love-stricken dupe? I shall lay out the facts for you, my dear Reverend Whistler. Wait, why am I reverend? Does reverend mean something else in the past? Because isn't a reverend like one of those religious dudes? Does an elder mean like revered? Because I feel like people were called each other revered in the past. I don't know. Let's move on. And we'll put it to our jury of listeners to issue the final verdict. How exciting. Keeping up with the Blandies. Mary Blandy's exact date of birth is not known. We know that the month was July, the year 1720. She was born into a wealthy family residing in Henley on Thames on the border between the counties of Oxfordshire and Berkshire, England. Berkshire. Sorry, it's spelt Berkshire. I used to live there and I still can't say it right. Berkshire, England. I used to live very near here. You sound like you're from London. Rowing enthusiasts should be familiar with the pleasant market town, home to the annual Raw Regatta. This location has a solid reputation for being rather posh, a much sought after postcode for the rich and famous. In fact, I've lived there for many years before Simon kindly offered unpaid accommodations in the ever expanding cellar of scribblers. Arnaldo is not in my basement <laughs> for the police listening. It's just a joke. Don't come to my house. Not looking in the basement. Yeah. But it is a fact that mega rich rock stars such as the late George Harrison have or had made Henley their home or second home or third home. Back in the 18th century, the town did not attract star musicians yet. It was more common to rub elbows with upper middle class professionals such as Mary Blandy's father Francis, an attorney and town clerk. This is interesting. Like these areas of the UK, they still like Berkshire's been nice. I'm pretty sure like it, we're back in the 18th century. And it's like, yeah, or 19th century? What? 18th century. And it's, it was still nice. And even today, it's still nice. Like I feel other like doesn't America I feel like in America I was reading on Reddit and it was like someone was like yeah this used to be a nice area and then it became rough I feel like in the UK areas just become nice and then they stay nice forever there's no am, am I totally wrong about that I feel like that's true no one worries about buying a house in a nice area that soon it's not going to be a nice area it's just always going to be nice Francis and his wife also called Mary doted on their daughter blessed with intelligence culture wit grace and a fine figure alas at a young age mary jr had contracted smallpox and her face had been scarred by the marks typical of the disease mr francis being a good pragmatist realized that his daughter's tainted beauty may not be enough to attract a suitable suitor therefore when mary reached marrying age he spread word that her dowry amounted to ten thousand pounds which i'm sure was an extraordinary absolutely extraordinary amount of money back in the day in the mid-18th century, that kind of money could have bought you 2,141 cows or 1,459 horses. So it's a lot of money. Is Arnaldo going to try? And he is, he is. In today's money, we're talking about more than 2.3 million pounds or almost 2.9 million dollars. So yeah, quite the sum. Where do I sign up? Decades later, Jane Austen would open her most famous novel with the lines... It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. To paraphrase, we could say that it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of no fortune must be in want of a wife with a rich dad. Yes, as you may expect, Mary soon started to entertain scores of gentlemen callers, but she wouldn't just settle for any fashionable fop in a powdered wig and tight breeches. And when she didn't reject her suitors, it was her parents who deemed them not good enough for their lovely daughter. Smallpox sucks. So there's this beautiful young girl, and it's like, oh, yeah, you got smallpox, and now your face is scarred forever. And you've, you must have seen those photos of people with, like, smallpox in the past. It is not good. Like, it just leaves your, your whole, like, face and body just pockmarked horribly. And, uh, yeah, fortunately, we have vaccines. Vaccines are awesome. It's always like, yeah. I wonder how long an anti-vaxxer would be anti-vaxxing if we were like, okay, well, we're not going to give you a jab. Well, you don't get a jab for smallpox. We're going to put you in a room with uh, a canister. And uh, inside that canister is smallpox. How quick are they going to be like, give me that vaccine? I mean, it would need to. This isn't a realistic example because you'd need to have the vaccine like, I don't know, weeks before, months before. How long does that take to work? I don't know. But yeah, I'm always like, well... The, this, the reason people are anti-vax is because they don't realize how horrible these diseases that we've essentially eradicated were. Like, just go look at pictures of smallpox if you want a clue. Mm. Mm. And I'm not suggesting that we give Andrew Wakefield smallpox, but it would be uh, 
I don't want to ever say smallpox is funny, but I think that could be the one situation where smallpox might actually be funny. At that age, most respectable women in her position had already tied the knot and given birth to scores of children, or had died of some gastrointestinal fever that today could be sorted out with access to clean water. But she was still unmarried, or as she was described back then, she was a spinster at 27. The past, everybody. Today, we would call her simply a single lady, and she was waiting for the right man to put a ring on it. The Duplicitous Captain The world started spinning in the right direction for Mary one fateful night when the Blandys attended a dinner party hosted by their friends, Lord Mark Kerr. At the candlelit table, our protagonist locked eyes with one of the guests, Captain William Henry Crowston. Allow me to imagine a swarm of ill-concealed passions staining her cheeks in a red as bright as ruby as deep as sin. I like to picture this first meeting if portrayed in a Bodice? Bodice? Bodice. Right? Bodice ripping romantic level from the likes of Dame Barbara Cartland. I know, I don't know who's Barbara Cartland. I get the feeling she's a novelist who writes like historic romance stuff. Okay, I don't know, I could be entirely wrong there. Well, Arnaldo did say she's romantic novel, so I guess I am right. I, I could just read this, couldn't I? The covers of these novels usually feature an astonishingly beautiful lady, corset half undone, swooning into the muscular arms of some period inaccurate hunk, sporting long hair and pecs so chiseled you could play the bongos onto them. She was made a dame for writing. She writes no romance novels? Wow, okay. A quick scan through the pages of such romances may introduce the virgin reader to a cornucopia of suggested euphemisms such as. Cue the sack solo, Jen! Lascivious, heaving, tumescent, turgid, throbbing, manhood. <laughs> Holy sh <laughs> Dame. But I'm afraid, my dear listeners, that Captain Crowston was no Mr. Darcy, as portrayed by a young and humid Colin Firth. Contemporary descriptions render him as short, overweight, and scarred by pox marks. Nevertheless, he appeared as an adequate prospect to both Mary and her parents. He was an officer with the Royal Marines with solid battle experience. Things women used to look for in a husband. Battle experience. So with all due respect, are you sure this is our best option? I mean, I suppose that is still kind of sexy, isn't it? In fact, he had once fought for the Jacobites against Her Majesty's government. Traitor! To oversimplify, Jack... Cobitism was a religious movement, very prominent in Scotland, which advocated for the restoration of the Stuart dynasty on the British throne. Many Scottish nobles had joined the Jacobite ranks, but had later returned into the fold of the British army, and Captain Cranston was one of them. I wonder how your promotion uh, uh, prospects are after you've betrayed your army, gone to fight for someone else, and come back and be like, that no, was wrong. <laughs> Looks like you're going to be a captain for a while, mate. He was, in fact, the fifth son of a Scottish peer related to many nobles north of the border. Sure, a fifth son was expected to inherit little more than hot air and kind words from his parents' estate, but Cranston belonged to nobility. Nonetheless, Francis Blandy encouraged the courtship, welcoming the captain into his home. The romance was swelling, but it soon burst. Francis Blandy's good friend Lord Kern revealed that Cranston had already got a wife, and he had a child living in Scotland. Uh-oh. It appears that on the 22nd of May, 1744, Cranston had married one Anne Murray. In Edinburgh, the marriage had been sealed in secret as Anne was Roman Catholic while William was a Presbyterian. Oh no! <laughs> Two people of different parts of the same faith getting married. Are these the same faith? Presbyterian and Catholic, it all sounds like, you know, some weird offshoot of Christianity, doesn't it? Who cares? On the 19th of February, 1745, Anne had just given birth to a baby daughter. When confronted with these facts, the captain vehemently denied being already married. In his own version, Anne Murray was merely his mistress. He had at one time promised to marry her, but on the condition that she converted to Protestantism. Presbyterian, Catholics, Protestants, I'm so... I don't know. I, <laughs> why, is, why is one religion so confusing? I don't understand. When she refused, it called off the engagement, but Mr. Blandy became highly suspicious of Cranston and made further inquiries. In early 1748, Blandy learned that Anne Murray had taken action in Edinburgh's commissary court to have the marriage declared legal. Blandy confronted Cranston again, demanding the truth. The captain was cornered, but he insisted that the two had never been married. He was confident the Scottish court would rule in his favor. Mr. Blandy was distrustful, and yet his wife and daughter were squarely in Cranston's corner. They even invited the captain to stay at their place for six months. Whilst he was there, Francis Blandy received a letter from Edinburgh carrying interesting news. 
On the 1st of March, 1748, the court had issued its verdict. William Cranston and Anne Murray were indeed man and wife. Oh no! This is like a, a romance novel, isn't it? <laughs> With more smallpox than, than typical. Botanical Remedies I realize that thus far this episode is more like casual civilist rather than casual criminalist, but don't worry, we'll soon get to the point where someone dies in atrocious fits of pain for your entertainment. <laughs> you <laughs> sickos. <laughs> you are insane. Captain Cranstown reassured his prospective father-in-law that he would fix this whole mess. He set out for London to consult with his attorneys and file an appeal. A few days later, Mary and her mother also visited London. Mrs. Blandy had been suffering from gastrointestinal trouble and needed to see a specialist. The specialist is like, you know what would really treat this? That clean water we talked about before, but we don't have that. During those days, Mary evaded her mother's watchful eye to escape to St. James's Square. There she met frequently with her beau, and together they decided to arrange a secret marriage. Back then, the Church of England allowed for marriages to take place anywhere, provided they were celebrated by an ordained clergyman. No paperwork required, no questions asked. Important lesson there, don't ever get too drunk at a party with a clergyman present. <laughs> You're gonna wake up, there's gonna be a lot of married people. This custom encouraged the practice of secret marriages conducted without parental consent and often involving bigamous grooms or brides. It appears that this secret union actually took place, although it was clearly not legal. Crassdown's appeal against this marriage in Scotland had not yet been filed. In summer of 1749, Mary and her mother returned to Henley. In September, Mrs. Blandy's conditions worsened. Oh no, she just needs clean water and we don't even have that! Mary fetched for the local pharmacist, Mr. Norton, who called for Dr. Addington. But there was nothing they could do. Mrs. Blandy died on the 20th of September, 1749. Recorded cause of death? Intestinal inflammation. Or was it? Oh, it's not to do with the water. She's been poisoned. Oh, the death has happened. Yes! Based on what happened later, contemporary chroniclers suspected foul play. Someone, and by someone we mean Mary and Cranston, may have slipped some pernicious powders into Mrs. Blandy's food. This is plausible but unlikely. Mrs. Blandy had always been an ally to the lovers. What would be the motive to get rid of her? It would have made more sense to eliminate the other Blandy. Yes, why didn't they just kill the one who's the actual problem? <laughs> but let's not get ahead of ourselves. After the death of his future mother-in-law, Captain Cranston returned to Henley, even though Mr. Blandy was by now openly hostile to his presence. Mary was concerned. She needed her father's approval to marry. Wait, didn't we just discuss secret marriages? Can't they get that married, that previous marriage, get rid of that, and then get married in like the secret marriage that seems to actually be legal? Oh, of course. And Cranston was concerned. He needed her father's dowry. Yeah, he's not just marrying her for a stunning smallpoxy good looks. He wants that. What was it like? Three million dollars? Some two point something million pounds? Holy sh! He wants that. He wants that coin. So today's video of the show is brought to you by AG1 by Athletic Greens, which is a comprehensive all-in-one's green powder, which is engineered to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet and support your body's nutritional needs across the four pillars of health. What are they? Gut health, immune support, energy, and recovery. Look, it's packed with 75 vitamins and minerals. They're all listed on the back here. It's a very, very long list. And you would be hard pressed to find a more comprehensive supplement on the market. Now, look, you guys know I'm not exactly a fitness YouTuber, podcaster. Um, that is probably self evident. And because of that, I know that I have some gaps in my diet. I don't always eat the most healthy. And I know that by having AG1, I put this, uh, uh, I have this along with my coffee every morning. I know it sort of fills those gaps that I for sure have. It also tastes great. There's less than one gram of sugar in there, but despite that, it tastes amazing. It's also dairy free, paleo, vegan, keto. So low allergen and low calorie, which is brilliant. I kind of, I, I feel like with this with the coffee, I feel like I'm drinking less coffee because it sort of sustains my energy somehow. Don't know if it's sort of, you know, placebo effect or whatever, but I like it and it makes me feel good. And it's got all those, uh, got all those extra vitamins and minerals that I need. <laughs> So if this sounds like the supplement that you could be after, all you need to do is go to athleticgreens.com forward slash TCC. And not only can you order your Athletic Greens there, but you also get a bonus. You get five of these individual travel packs, which are handy for when you're on the road. And also you get a year's supply of vitamin D, which is fantastic. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash TCC, or there's a link below. And now back to today's video. A plan started to form. 
Cranston mentioned to Mary that she knew one Mrs. Morgan back in Scotland, a cunning woman, an expert at making love powders. Uh-oh. By slipping them into Mr. Blandy's food or drink, he would feel better disposed towards the captain and towards the idea of the two lovers marrying. The concept of a love powder was quite widespread at the time. Countless quacks would peddle these popular remedies, claiming they could soften the attitude of the sternest of foes or even help people fall in love. <laughs> While they grind it up in there, what's in there? Yeah, yeah, no, it's just morphine. It's just heroin. That's it. Softens people up. I mean, heroin does, doesn't it? It really does. It really does. What heroin? I won't even dignify them with a rhetorical question. Did they actually work? Because, of course, they f***ing didn't. Ah! Typical ingredients of such powers included henbane, also known as stinking nightshade. That sounds poisonous. <laughs> like, I know nightshade is poisonous, and I get the feeling the stinking variety is is not less poisonous somehow. Which sounds like an insult you'd hurl against a herb. Must be blood. Tui, that's disgusting. You stinking nightshade, you filthy piece of botanical sh**. Oh, now, do <laughs> you and me both are dads, and we love those dad jokes. And it deserves an insult, considering that it contains the poison scopolamine. Oh no! Now we don't know the alleged composition of Mrs. Morgan's alleged love powder. I think we're safe from uh, getting in trouble for this one, on now. It was the 18th century. We're gonna get sued by the Blandy estate. I mean, I don't think so. It's been a few hundred years. There's rules against that shit, right? <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> Allegedly. We only know that Crassdown traveled all the way to Scotland to acquire it and returned to Henley in August 1750. Once again, the captain made himself at home in the Blandy residence. Talk about unwanted guests. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> why is he allowed? Get out! Get out! <laughs> the captain stayed until November 1750 and somehow managed to slip some pinches of love powders into the Blandy's tea. It wouldn't be that hard if you're living in someone's house to slip poison into their tea, would it? According to later testimony from Mary herself, her father did seem to mellow. At the same time, though, strange events took place. The house appeared to be haunted by some kind of poltergeist. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's not a poltergeist, but uh, you people are getting poisoned by something that's making you see things. Mary could hear disembodied hands rapping on walls, invisible feet rustling about, doors banging and slamming. On one occasion, she even heard some unearthly scotch music. <laughs> it's truth truth we've all heard bagpipes and we've all been like get that devil's music out of here the haunting culminated when one night a spectral presence resembling mr blandy burst into cranston's room were these early premonitions of the doom that was to fall the house of blandy sure enough francis blandy's health soon began deteriorating the 62 year old already suffered from gout but he was now beset with colic and heartburn these are these are slovenly diseases aren't they like gout's that one you get from eating too much good food and also heartburn and i don't know what colic is isn't that something babies get like if a colicky baby but heartburn's also you ate too much spicy food didn't you did you overdo it on the tikka masala come on his teeth started to fall out but you got to be brushing those the love powders had appeared to soften his stance towards cranstown but it was only a temporary phase mr blandy could not stand the sight of cranstown and told mary that he should not show his face around the house. Not until he had sorted out his legal troubles, with his Scottish wife at least. Unbeknownst to Blandy, the captain's appeal had already been lodged with the Scottish courts, and it had already been rejected. The captain and Anne Murray were legally married, for all intents and purposes. During the winter of 1750-51, to 51, Cranstown wisely acquiesced to Blandy's will and retreated back to Scotland. From there, he sent a packet to Mary in April 1751, which contained some Scottish pebbles. These were just that pebbles but back in the day they were all the rage in higher society as they were used to decorate flower beds and potted plants okay aren't pebbles kind of free just go to the beach and get some pebbles alongside the pebbles cranston sent some white powder hey hey this was labeled as a substance to properly clean the decorative pebbles but in his letters cranston described it as mrs morgan's love powders and he asked mary to continue the treatment mixing the granules into her father's tea allegedly mary had some doubts as to the effectiveness of the concoction and even raised concerns about the effects on her dad's health mary you're a bit of a dum-dum aren't you <laughs> these two guys are enemy enemies he keeps sending you powder that he's asking you to mix into your dad's tea and he's getting really really sick and you're like i'm just just a love potion ah! nonetheless she executed the orders of her bow and the consequences would soon become apparent a cruel gruel during june of 1751 francis blandy felt sicker and sicker not only him two members of staff maid susan gunnell and cleaning woman anne emmett had the bad idea of drinking some of his leftover tea 
They both fell violently ill for three days. Mary took an interest in their well-being, making sure they drank white wine, whey, and broth. This sounds like the most disgusting cocktail ever, but at the time it was believed to be a cure against arsenic poisoning. Oh, the past. There we go. Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> they were really mixing wine, whey, and broth together? Wine and broth together doesn't sound bad. It kind of sounds like a weird soup. But whey? <laughs> what are you doing? So there you go. Mary later claimed to believe Mrs. Morgan's love powder was a herbal cure to soften her father's temper, and yet she administered a cure known for arsenic. Well, maybe, Mary, maybe you're not such a dum dum, and you're actually, what we would say, complicit. Uh oh, someone's going to get hanged. Off with his head. <laughs> was Mary, in good faith, sincerely trying to change her father's opinion of Cranstown via chemistry? applied to magic or was she conspiring with her lover to eliminate the person who most opposed their union yes i think she's trying to kill her own dad uh as arnaldo said at the beginning it's what like patricide i mean he said like was talking about how she's doing this crime either she is the dumbest person in the world and also just flukes into like this arsenic poisoning and she really can't put it together or she is guilty as sin in my opinion so far it seems that she is as guilty as sin in any case, in her letters to Cranstown, Mary only referred to the substance as powders, and she wrote that the powders were not working. Was this a reference to the fact that Blandy still hated the captain or that Francis was still alive? Definitely the fact that uh, he's still alive, in my opinion, allegedly. <laughs> Cranstown replied to continue with the plan. On the 4th of August, Mary asked Susan, the housemaid, to prepare some gruel for her father. For the uninitiated, gruel is a thinner version of porridge which can be drunk directly from a cup. It's also what Oliver Twist wanted more of. I am sorry if I'm offending the oatmeal aficionados, but it sounds absolutely disgusting with or without arsenic. It doesn't sound as bad. I didn't really know what gruel was until now. And I'm like, I mean, oatmeal's not the best thing ever. Watered down oatmeal's probably not brilliant. But I have to say, I imagine gruel as being something worse somehow. I don't know what it, what, what it exactly it was, but I kind of imagined it to be made out of cardboard, like that weird grey cardboard, you know, that cereal boxes are made out of, like mushed up in in water and then fed to people. I have no idea why that's what I, what gruel was in my mind, but obviously I was incorrect because that's not food, is it? The following evening, Susan, Susan served the gruel to Mr. Blandy. Upon drinking it, he almost immediately experienced violent stomach pain and started vomiting. He pulled through the night, and on Tuesday morning, he was seen by Mr. Norton, the apothecary. When the man asked about the patient's diet, Mary lied and replied that it only had peas the night before. That night, Susan was ordered to warm up the leftovers of the gruel. Reheated gruel sounds even more disgusting with or without arsenic. Nevertheless, Mr. Blandy still fancied some of it. Mr. Blandy, are you f***ing insane? <laughs> I once didn't eat Chinese food for like two years because I got a Chinese takeaway and it made me so sick. I was just like food poisoned by this Chinese takeaway. I was like throwing up everywhere, shitting all day. And I just, every time I just looked at a Chinese restaurant or looked at Chinese food, I was like, oh, oh, oh. And uh, now I love Chinese food again, but it took me a long time to get over it. I, also, I didn't drink rum for years because I once got so smashed on rum. And I was like, I can't drink this anymore. And now I love rum. You get over everything. It's brilliant. I'm going to rum and Chinese food tonight. Hell yeah. Unsurprisingly, Blandy started retching again. On Wednesday morning, the remaining gruel was brought back into the kitchen. And in it, the house cleaner tucked into the leftovers and promptly threw up. Susan Gunn, mmm, <laughs> reheated leftover gruel. People in the past were really desperate. It's kind of sad. Susan Gunnell suggested disposing of the remaining foul concoction to put an end to that wretch fest, but Mary overruled her. The current batch was perfectly fine and could be reheated again. At this stage, Susan became suspicious. It was clear that the porridge was causing people to feel terrible. So why was Mary insisting on dishing it out to her father yet again? I don't know. Maybe because she wants him to be sick and die. <laughs> it's bloody obvious, isn't it? A maid investigates. A resourceful maid turned into an amateur sleuth and examined the pan used to cook the preparation. She noticed a white, gritty settlement at the bottom. Being adept in the art of slaying rats by means of poison, she immediately recognized the substance. It looked like arsenic. Surprise! <laughs> Susan hid the pan away from Mary, and the next day took it to a neighbor, Mrs. Mountainy, who summoned Norton, the apothecary. The chemist took the pan to his lab and promised to perform tests on the white powder. He gives it a little taste, does he? Ooh, I'm definitely poisoned. 
On Friday the 9th of August, the Blandys were visited by Mary's maternal uncle, Reverend Stevens. Susan called him aside and confided to him a terrible suspicion. Mary was trying to poison her own father. Stevens was appalled at the news and advised Susan to speak to Mr. Blandy. The next day, Susan mustered her courage and spoke to Blandy. After an initial moment of shock, the man realized that this could indeed be the case. Maybe it's because he feels like he's been horribly poisoned many times and his teeth have fallen out. He wondered who could have given the poison to Mary. And <laughs> I wonder. And Susan suggested Cranstown. Francis exclaimed, Oh, that villain! I remember he mentioned a particular poison that they had in their country. Had I been in his place, I would have immediately escaped that house, or at least rejected any other meal served within its walls. But clearly, Blandy was endowed with more fatalistic courage, and he simply went downstairs to have breakfast. What are you up to? Oh my god. His clerk, Robert Littleton, and Mary were present. Mary served a cup of tea to her father. Again, the hell I would have drunk from that cup. Yes, are you insane, Blando? Come on. But Blandy tasted it, and glaring straight into Mary's eyes, he remarked how bad it tasted. Had she put anything into it? He wondered. Thus confronted, Mary trembled. Blandy then stood up. As he left the room, he stared again at his daughter and said, It is my fortune to be poisoned at last. Mary must have understood that the game was up. She rushed into her room, retrieved some letters and a packet of powder, and threw them into the kitchen fire. Susan, that legend, was able to rescue the packet, which bore the label, the powder to clean the pebbles with. Not exactly conclusive, is it? But, um, th th this is, this is locked down. Someone is going to the gallows! On that very day, Mr. Blandy worsened again. Mary herself called for the physician who had treated her mother, the eminent Dr. Addington. The doctor examined Blandy and found that he had bloodshot eyes, a yellow complexion, swollen tongue, inflamed throat, and dry lips. All combined, these symptoms suggested poisoning. As Addington was about to leave, Susan sneakily pressed into his hands the small packet of white powder that he had saved from the fire. The good doctor visited again Mr. Blandy over the next days and asked him if he had a suspect in mind. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he named his own daughter as the poisoner, describing her as a poor, lovesick girl. He then added, I forgive her. CSI, 18th century. Jen, I don't know if we're going to get away with it, but cue that, that Who song where David Caruso puts on his glasses. Ow! Sorry. Maybe you didn't hear that because uh, this also goes out on YouTube and I'm not sure if that, that second will be like claimed by, you know, Universal Music or whoever. It's like, come on, we're just trying to have fun. Stop it. Dr. Addington took action and proceeded to question Mary. Sunglasses on. <laughs> Did she really believe that Cranston had been providing her with love powder? Had she never suspected that she had been unwittingly poisoning her father? Or maybe she had been wittingly doing so? Maybe? I mean, what what could have given you that idea? Perhaps the idea that as soon as she was confronted, she was like, Game's up! And uh, threw all that shit in the fire rather than be like, What are you talking about, Dad? I've just been giving you this love potion, if anything, to make you fall in love with my... Or, like, make you okay with the love of my... It was a weird situation, right? She's fucking hanging! Come on! To be on the safe side, the doctor had Mary locked in her bedroom and placed under guard. Where are the police? <laughs> Why is the doctor doing this? This is not what doctors do. Mr. Blandy, by now on his deathbed, said he was ready to forgive Mary and called for her. The woman fell on her knees, begging for forgiveness. Once more, she claimed not knowing the white powder was arsenic. To Blandy! The blame lay squarely on Cranston's shoulders. He lamented, Oh, such a villain! Come to my house, ate of the best, and drank of the best that my house could afford to take away my life and ruin my daughter. Two days later, on the 14th of August, 1751, he slipped in and out of consciousness until he exhaled his last breath around two in the afternoon. It was time to launch an official inquiry. The use of forensic medicine in criminal matters was still in its infancy, but the seriousness of the case demanded for some serious scientific muscle. Yes, arsenic. I'm now poisoned. Dr. Adding was joined by a team of medical professionals to perform an autopsy. 
These were the local apothecary, Mr. Norton, a surgeon, Mr. Nicholas, and another physician, Dr. Lewis. Yes, surgeons, uh, that they, they use, um, I think they even still are today in the UK. Like, if you become a certain level of surgeon, you're not a doctor anymore. You go back to being a mister, which is like super weird, but apparently it's some like, you know, if you're mister as a surgeon, they'll, you know, like, you know, some dickhead will be like, oh, it's not Mr. So-and-so, it's actually Dr. So-and-so. Apparently, at some point, surgeons get so elite that they become Mr. And people are, it's not Dr. So-and-so, it's Mr. So-and-so. <laughs> I was like, that's quite interesting. Because I don't need Mr. to make this body feel any older. Addington's observations are stomach churning, as you would expect from a post-mortem. For example, he found purple spots on the victim's heart, black stains in his lungs, and a peculiar discoloration on his liver and spleen. <laughs> Back in the day, autopsy be like, that's interesting. It shouldn't be that color. <laughs> Combined with other elements, Addington's findings pointed to only one possible cause of death. Poisoning. The coroner in charge of the inquest also collected statements from Susan and other members of the staff. His conclusion was that Mary Blandy did poison and murder him. Dun dun da! Shocking revelation! The type of poison used was analyzed by Addington with the help of two chemists in nearby Reading. They collected the sediment salvaged from the pan plus the powders retrieved by Susan. They then tossed them onto a red hot iron and observed that the powder did not burst into flames but arose in thick, white fumes which smelled of garlic. The result confirmed that the powder was indeed arsenic. In the meanwhile, Mary was still under house arrest, confined to her rooms under the watchful eye of Ed Hearn, a parish clerk. But not for long. Why are these parish clerks? What's he doing this job for? Why is the doctor being a scientist and the other doctor being a jailer? What's th This is very strange. What's up the past? Escape and capture. On the 15th of August, the day after Blandy's death, Ed left her unguarded. Apparently, he had been called to dig Mr. Blandy's grave. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's insane. The murderer escapes because the guy guarding her is too busy giving, too, too busy digging the grave for the murder victim. <laughs> the past. But this hand guy also happened to be an old pretender to Mary's hand, so he may have voluntarily left his post. Whatever the reason, Mary seized the moment. Cautiously, she peered out of her door, silently glided through the empty hallways of her house, and walked out onto the streets of Henley. Only a few yards separated her from the Henley Bridge over the River Thames. Mary walked briskly, hoping to leave the town unnoticed. But word had spread of a parasitical act. Someone did see her. They raised the alarm, and a baying mob chased after her. What a scene. What pathos. A popular streaming service should take note and adapt this story into a costume drama combining gritty realism with a cavalier attitude to historical myth. <laughs> we got like a page of screenplay. Let's go! Exterior. Night. A group of drunken tavern dwellers are swigging pints of ale in the streets of Penley, lit by a pale moon. Mary Blandy sneaks undetected amongst them, hastily making for the bridge. A gust of wind removes her hood. Mary Blandy. Oh, dear heavens. Toothless tavern wench. Gore blimey, lads, tis her, the father slayer. She's running away. Town crier cries. <laughs> Red nosed reverend. Tis true, tis her, come hither, my brethren. Let us apprehend her. Town people. Huzzah! A mob of drunken town people give chase. Somehow, they're now equipped with pitchforks and torches. A chimney sweeper is trampled by the mob as he falls on the ground. A louse bites him. He contracts typhus. He coughs and dies. Always, that's quite Monty Python-esque, isn't it? I have to say, I did. I, I do think. I, I think it would be totally illegal, copyright-wise. But there's so many scripts for movies and TV shows that are never made, or pilots that are never aired, and the the scripts make their way onto an amazing website. There's two of them. Um, oh, what's the, the big one's called Drew's Scriptorama, and it's got like there'll be like movies where scripts were written like 10 years ago and then you know 10 years later they make a different version of the script like and i thought it would be a great idea for a youtube channel to do like table reads of these to get people to sit down and like so someone would narrate someone would read the different characters and you just play it out in like you know not really acted but like an audio play sort of way uh, I thought that'd be brilliant for all these unmade movies because I've just read my way through entire scripts of movies that have never been made and it plays out in your head and it's amazing. Um, but I don't think that that would be allowed copyright wise, but it would be awesome.
Mary Blandy. You scurrilous rabble, you shall never catch me. The one was almost caught her. Captain Cranston emerges from the river below. He vaults over the parapet of the bridge and faces the mob. His moist white shirt clings to his sculpted pectorals. His breeches are so tight the audience has difficulty breathing. Isn't this the short fat guy who <laughs> has smallpox scars? Captain. You are to rapscallions who ever shall. Oh, sorry, he's Scottish. A Scottish accent. God, I'm not even going to try. Sean Connery Scottish, yes? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to try. It's too bad. Your heart are rapscallions. Whoever shall take you the step forward shall taste my blade. I tried, and it was horrible. Please don't hate me. A group of men take a step forward. The captain whips out his tumescent katana, <laughs> turgidly throbbing away at the oncoming attackers. Tumescent means erect. <laughs> They all scream in pain. They contract sepsis and die. <laughs> the toothless tavern wedge creeps from behind with a dagger. Mary intercepts her and sends her flying into the river with, the mo with a move of Aikido. The wench accidentally drinks the unsanitary waters of the Thames. She contracts cholera and dies. The mob retreats. Mary Blandy. May the Lord bless you, my beloved captain. Hast thou brought along some of the portentous love powder? Captain. Why, my dear, of course, and I shall give it to you. I shall give it to you good. <laughs> the captain lays two long, thin, perfectly parallel lines of white powder. <laughs> Holy s***. Arnaldo, you have absolutely missed your calling. Stop writing for me and start submitting screenplays. I mean, it's absurd comedy, but it's awesome. I admit this last page may have been the result of a double espresso too many. This whole episode today has been the result of many too many espressos. I've had like four coffees this morning and it's showing. And I hope our dear audience has already guessed that the truth was far more mundane. Mary managed to cross the bridge without too much difficulty and found refuge in a nearby tavern, the Little Angel, which, by the way, still in business. Then Captain Cranston was not present at the incident. He was in Scotland at that time after the narrow escape from the mob. A family, we should have done this whole episode in that pub. That would have been awesome. Bring the script in, bring a camera in, get some pints going. <laughs> that would have been super atmospheric. I love it. But also really complicated would have involved flights and booking out a pub and all of this stuff that would have made this a huge loss for me financially. Let's do it again. But you can make that happen by supporting me on Patreon. Not really. I don't do Patreon. I don't really like it. I make enough money from the ads. Thanks for watching the ads. If you do, if you skip them, just know that you're absolutely shafting me and I'm devastated. You gonna make me rich. And Captain Cranston was not present at the incident. He was in Scotland at the time after the narrow escape from the mob. A family friend offered to escort Mary back to her house. Before leaving the inn, she allegedly confessed to a couple of patrons that she was fully aware of giving poison to her father. On the 16th of August, the mayor of Henley issued an arrest warrant against Mary. On the following day, she was escorted to the nearby county prison, Oxford Castle. Always a lady, Mary brought along one of her maids and her tea caddy. In fact, she did enjoy preferential treatment. She was allowed to entertain visitors, serve tea, play cards, and even stroll in the gardens of the head warden. While preparing this episode, I visited Oxford Prison with my unpaid research assistant, i.e. my 12-year-old daughter. Aww. We had the opportunity to visit a reconstruction of Mary Blandy's cell, which, while not luxurious, was certainly more comfortable than the ordinary cells reserved for the riffraff. The tour guide boasted that Oxford Castle is now the eternal residence of Mary Blandy's ghost. At which point on out I shouted, Ah! Ghosts aren't real, you idiot! No, no, no one would ever do that, because you'd be such... It's, even though you're screaming that, I'm screaming that in my mind. Which apparently has been spotted, heard, or perceived around the building. Interestingly, this jail is built around a much older Saxon tower itself, erected above an underground chapel. According to the tour guide, a corner within the chapel is the most haunted spot in all of Oxford. Ah, the guide challenged the tour participants to stand in said corner, and only my daughter dared braving this supposed hotbed for ghosts. I took a photo, which of course showed a mysterious tiny orb of light floating next to my daughter. Was it Mary popping in to say good morrow to thee? I'll leave it to Simon to comment on the likelihood of such an occurrence and the return to the main narrative. <laughs> no. No, 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 no! The good times for Mary in a luxury jail cell ended when authorities picked up rumors of an escape plan being plotted in London. From then on, she had to wear shackles around her ankle and was not allowed in the gardens any longer. <laughs> Those rumors really ruined her day. 
She wouldn't have to suffer these humiliations for long, as the day of the trial was approaching. And also, back in the older days, they were like, guilty! And uh, Eddie appeals, no, 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 you go right to the hangman right now. Maybe we'll execute you tomorrow if we're feeling generous. And nowadays, it's like, how long has he been on death row? 20 years? Dude. Manslaughter or murder? Back in the 18th century, the prosecution at trials was initiated and funded by relatives of the victim. That sounds fair. But in this case, the victim's relatives were also relatives of the accused party. Understandably, they didn't want to pay for a prosecution. As Mr. Blandy had been a town clerk, Henley's town council could have footed the legal bill, but those cheapskate refused to do so. Instead, they petitioned the Secretary of State, Duke of Newcastle, asking for the government to pay for the prosecution. Wow, so in the past, if you just murder poor people, that's fine, because then no one could pay for the prosecution. Ha! The government agreed, appointing three lawyers. Mary also hired three defense attorneys, which was rather uncommon at the time. The trial eventually took place on the 3rd of March, 1752, before the Oxford Court of Assizes, to be presided over by Judge Hene Henage Leggy. Nope, no idea how to pronounce that. <laughs> yeah, me neither, Arnaldo. <laughs> and Sir Sidney Stafford Smythe. Great name. The quadruple S right there. The prosecution called Dr. Addington and the other medical professionals as witnesses. They confirmed that the substance being fed to Mr. Blandy was arsenic. Next, Susan and the other house staff testified that Mary had been in possession of the powder and insisted her father be served the same vomit-inducing gruel again and again. This is a slab dunk case now i should point out that nobody had actually seen mary mixing the white powder with her father's food or drink nonetheless mary admitted to feeding the substance to mr blandy what are your three lawyers up to <laughs> come on get to it but the thesis of the defense was that she was unaware of the true nature of the compound to her it was harmless love powder not arsenic okay that does make a little bit of sense in april 2022 a stage production at henley's kenton theater has reenacted mary's trial at the end of the performance the audience was asked to play the part of the jury their opinion was that mary's premeditation culpability could not be proved beyond reasonable doubt the final verdict was manslaughter I contacted local historians, including Mrs. Hilary Fisher in Henley, to ask their opinion on the Blandy case. To quote their general views, by the way, Arnaldo, this is some above and beyond sh right here. You went with your reason, your 12 year old daughter to the jail. You've like called a local historian. Epic. Quote Mary was no starry eyed teenager on her first date. She had heard all the bad reports about Cranston, and she herself had found evidence of his duplicity. I find it hard to believe that a mature, reasonably intelligent, reasonably well educated woman of the world didn't stop to question what she was doing and continued doing it, even when it was obviously making her father ill. I would convict her of murder in the knowledge that she would probably not serve more than 15 years. Oh. Come on, old timeies, aren't we gonna hang her? <laughs> she seems pretty fucking guilty. <laughs> So these are the contemporary opinions. But what did the Oxford jury think back in 1752? After barely five minutes of deliberation, they returned the verdict. Mary Blandy was guilty of murder. Then Judge Legg addressed her. You are convicted of a crime so dreadful, so horrid in itself, that human nature shudders at it. The willful murder of your own father. That father with his dying breath forgave you. May your heavenly father do so too. Now... Nothing now remains but to renounce the sentence of the law upon you, which is that you are to be carried to the place of execution, and there hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may God, in his infinite mercy, receive your soul. The execution took place on Monday the 6th of April 1752, so basically a month later not immediately mary had spent her last days either praying or writing letters to king george ii hoping for a pardon that never arrived at half past eight mary was led to the gallows by the executioners a reverend and lord sheriff of oxford she was allowed to address the five thousand onlookers who had gathered for the spectacle once again she stated she was unaware that the powder was poison she then turned to the executioners gentlemen do not hang me high for the sake of decency with the noose around her neck Mary maintained her composure and never cried, unlike many among the crowd. The next morning, she was buried between her father and mother at St. Mary's Church in Henley. Conclusion But what of Captain William Cranston, you may ask? After all, he was the true guilty party in this whole tragic affair. At the time of the trial, Cranston was known to reside in Berwick-upon-Tweed, just south of the Scottish border. The government issued a warrant for his arrest, and the mayor of Henley dispatched a messenger to apprehend him. But the sneaky captain had already escaped. With help from his friends, Cranston crossed the channel and hid in Boulogne, France. 
From there, he moved eastward, chased by some of Mary's relatives. Eventually, he sought refuge in Flanders, where he fell ill of an unspecified disease. In November 1752, he was reported as being raving mad, beset with auditory hallucinations of heavenly music. A physician who visited him noted that his body was so swollen it seemed about to burst. Oh my god, that sounds horrible. The nefarious captain, the diabolical lover, met his demise on the 30th of November in the town of Ferns, Flanders. Authorities searched his possession, finding three of Mary's letters, later published in a pamphlet by an anonymous author. In the first letter, dated June 30, 1751, Mary admitted being conscious of the affair being discovered, and she feared the affair might be the occasion of a bad consequence to us both. In the third letter, August 1, 1751, she wrote, I am going forward with all convenient speed in the business, but am sometimes in the greatest frights, there being constantly about me so many to be kept insensible of the whole affair, and then, though I suffer for more horrors of mind, I will pursue that which is the only method of ever being happy together. She could still be talking about that love potion, couldn't she? She's kept it very vague on purpose, but, but, I don't know, she, she, she knew. She knew. She knew! It sounds as though Mary was fully aware of the seriousness of the affair or business in which she had become embroiled. She mentions horrors of the mind and need to keep people unaware or insensible of what is happening. But she always avoided direct mentions of arsenic or poison in her writings. She's smart. She's not writing down her crimes. She's alluding to her crimes. An illusion is not admission. Would these letters be treated as conclusive evidence in today's courts? I'll leave it to absolutely not. You've got to prove beyond all reasonable doubt that is nothing near close enough. I will leave it to you to interpret whether this was the admission of guilt from a calculating parasite or the concealed rants of a love-stricken pawn. I mean, I think the letters are one indicator, but there's also tons of other evidence that she she kept poisoning. She kept giving him the stuff and he kept getting sicker and sicker and then she enthusiastically gave him more. She knew what it was doing to him unquestionably in my mind what were you doing theater in oxford audience <laughs> dismembered appendices number one the case of mary blandy has some curious connections with the jacobite uprising captain cranston had fought on the jacobite side his scottish wife was herself a jacobite brother of a jacobite officer and niece of the secretary to bonnie prince charles the jacobite leader even some members of the blandy family had fought on the rebel side the uprising had been dealt a deathly blow in 1746 but british society still held much resentment against jacobitism so mary and cranston's connection to that rebellion was picked up by the press at the time and it has been speculated this resentment may have played a part in Mary's guilty verdict. Or what could have played a part in Mary's guilty verdict was her being f guilty as sin. Number two. Earlier on, I mentioned that Mary's ghost had been spotted at the Oxford Castle prison. Well, it seems like Mary's propensity for ubiquity as her spirit is said to be haunting also the Little Angel Tavern, now a country pub, and the Kenton Theatre, the location of a mock retrial, which is odd considering that the theatre was only opened in 1805 and it was constructed over an empty plot of land, so the ghost of Mary Blandy would have little reason to roam that particular spot. We can't explain ghosts on Aldo, can we? They can do whatever they want because they're not real. I felt, always found it interesting how people who led relatively normal and sedentary lives after death become some sort of wizard, time-traveling, space-warping ninja, capable of appearing in several locations, often at the same time, and able to interact with the material world in unexpected ways. Anyways, I'm not questioning here the veracity of Mary's ghost sightings. This is a topic that is suited for another of Simon's shows, Decoding the Unknown. Check that out on YouTube, you can search it. It's also a podcast. Some would say it's the sister podcast to Casual Criminalist. It's just a bit more ghosty. And don't think this means it's some paranormal channel. Someone was like, someone gave it a bad review and I posted it on Twitter. They were like, oh, another paranormal podcast. And I'm like, bro, this is like literally anti-paranormal. It's like, I oh, the only reason I didn't use skeptical in the title because it's got kind of like, it feels like such a negative word, whereas decoding the unknown felt like more, less negative. I don't like calling things like negative things. Anyway, not important for now. Thank you so much for watching this episode of this show, The Casual Criminalist, or listening if you're listening as a podcast. Brilliant stuff. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time. Bye.